Oh. Hi, my name is Arnold Michaelis. I'm a consultant, a speaker, educator, author, filmmaker, and uh, my work is informed by my past as a white nationalist skinhead. I'm very grateful to everyone at the McCain Institute for putting the Prevention Practitioners Network together, and I'm grateful to be a part of this conference. Talking about my experience leading into white nationalism and how I ultimately got out, I do think about uh, what opportunities were there for intervention? Uh, who could have uh, stepped in at, at what time and, and how, what would that have looked like? Uh, looking back as to how I got involved in white nationalism, it really had a lot to do with just dysfunction in my home. My father's alcoholism put a lot of pressure on my mother and she was miserable as I grew up. And, and that was really my pain point. And I reacted to that by lashing out at other kids. I, I was a bully on the school bus as early as kindergarten. That uh, antisocial behavior became like an addiction. I got stimulation from lashing out and, and uh, causing trouble in the classroom and disrupting things. And so as I grew older, the antisocial behavior kept escalating because I needed a, a bigger disturbance to get the same kind of rush that I had got previously. And so in this time of my childhood, when I'm, I'm, I, I need a constant challenge, I need constant stimulation, I need uh, an outlet for my aggressions. When people ask me what would have diverted me as a child uh, prior to getting involved in white nationalism, the first thing that comes to mind is always martial arts. I, I grew up uh, absolutely fascinated with all things Asian, and uh, it, it, you know it's certainly a reduction. It has nothing to do with really like Asian culture in general. But to me, like Asian was black belt theater on Saturday nights, kung fu movies, and me and my buddies would like whack this knot out of each other with pool sticks in my friend's basement while we watch these movies. And, but we were really fascinated by martial arts and fascinated by Kung Fu. I was a huge fan of Bruce Lee. I had posters on them all on my wall. And I, I grew up in a pretty well-to-do suburb. And by the standards of my, my peers, I was the poor kid. And so while all my friends were taking Taekwondo and karate lessons and actually realizing the, the martial arts that we were so fascinated with, my parents couldn't afford to uh, send me to, to any of that stuff. So I, it, it, that became part of my hurt. It, it, it certainly wasn't the, the big driver, but that was part of it. Like I, I couldn't have the things that my friends had and uh, that, that was frustrating. And, and it was especially frustrating with martial arts because I was so enamored of it. And between uh, third and fourth grade, the local school district had a, a thing through the rec department where they had a, a judo program in the high school gym for six weeks over the summer. And it was uh, through the rec department, it was pretty affordable. I think it was like 75 bucks for the six weeks, which was a, a real stretch for my parents to get together, but they, they knew how important it was to me and they, they did. And I, I started taking judo lessons. And I was absolutely in love with it from the second I walked onto the mat, from the second I, I put a gi on. And my uh, sensei was a Latina woman who was physically tiny, but just had this like presence about her that absolutely put me in awe. And uh, she was an Olympic judicon at one point. So, you know, very uh, accomplished in, in the art of judo. And the class involved adults as well as kids. And I'll never forget, there were guys who were like my size now, like 6'3", 225 pounds or so. And my sensei would just be like, kapow, like throw them around like it was nothing. And it, I, I was in awe of that, but I, I was more in awe of just her, her presence and, and uh, the, the effect she had on the room when she walked in. It just like I, I wanted to learn from her. I, I wanted to 
uh, please her. I wanted to do everything I could to, to get everything I could out of that judo lesson. And it's important to understand that like up until this point, there wasn't an adult in my life that could tell me what to do in, in, a, in a consistent way. I wouldn't listen to anybody, but I was there like ready to listen to my sensei and, and I love judo and I, I got super into it. I was really good at it. I uh, got my orange belt, which is uh, white, yellow, orange, the third belt in uh, within six weeks. I uh, competed in a couple tournaments and all I wanted to do with my life was judo. And then the six weeks was up and they're like, yeah, now it's 75 bucks a week to keep going. And my parents couldn't afford that. So my judo career ended as, as quickly as it had began. And it actually kind of backfired in that sense because now I was even angrier and I actually had some martial arts training about how to throw people around and, and physically fight. So I was like more angry and more dangerous with having judo taken from me by my parents and ability to, to keep it going. But I, I honestly believe that had I stayed in judo, it, it absolutely would have diverted me from white nationalism or any other kind of violent extremist group in the sense that it, it, it answered that need for identity, purpose, and belonging, which is where all violent extremist ideologies uh, stem from when people get involved in them. The, those needs of identity, purpose, and belonging are needs that all human beings have. And fortunately for the vast majority of human beings, we find healthy answers to those needs, whether it's judo or it's art or music or academics or activism or whatever. If you find a healthy answer to those needs, then it's, it's not a big gaping hole waiting for the, the unhealthy things to pile in. But um, in my case, I, I unfortunately couldn't continue with judo. I got involved in white nationalism when I was 16 years old. And uh, really because it, it repulsed people. It was so repulsive to civil society to see a swastika or see somebody uh, you know, claiming allegiance to Adolf Hitler that that's what attracted me to it was that, that repulsion that civil society had for white nationalism, much more so than the ideology itself. The ideology was really just kind of arbitrary. It was, it was that shock value that I was looking for. But I think back to my seven years involvement in white nationalism, and even then, I still think there, there was a very good opportunity for intervention um, in the form of martial arts. Uh, my buddies and I were all avid street fighters. And when I say that, people think, you know, I'm this big, tough fighter, but I was really just like a big, drunken kid that led with his face and got beat up as often as he, got, as he beat other people up. But uh, the bottom line is I was very accustomed to violence and I, I was happily wallowing in it and, it and it was just a normal thing to me um, to the point where we had a, a heavy bag hanging in the attic of this dingy place we lived in and we would watch the uh, movie Bloodsport, which is a very stylized you know, glimpse at uh, Muay Thai kickboxing but uh, in, of course, any martial arts movie, they have the whole training act where the, the guy's kicking trees and doing all this training stuff. But learning how to throw an elbow and learning how to hit someone with your knee or kick with your shin. And, and we studied that stuff and worked out on our heavy bag uh, regularly to the point where we could, I, I could throw a pretty devastating elbow and I could, I could legitimately... Uh, deliver a, a, a leg kick that was um, that, that showed that I was practicing it. And so when I think back to that time, if, if a, a real Muay Thai practitioner of, of which now I, you know, I'm a big follower of a lot of them, I'm a Saint Chai is my, my all time favorite right now. But if, if someone not necessarily of that stratosphere, but if, if a real Muay Thai practitioner would have been able to contact us somehow back then and just not even address any of the ideological stuff and just say, hey, you guys want to come work out at my gym? You know, let's let's learn some real Muay Thai. I, I would have been all over it. That whether that person was Asian or, or Afro-American or whatever, that if, if they were a, a true practitioner of that art and, and they invited me to come work out with them, 
my fascination with martial arts, I believe would have overridden the, my, my racial beliefs at the time. And I, I think uh, that would have been a really viable way to, to reach me and to intervene um, earlier than the, the seven year uh, span that I ended up being involved in white nationalism. And uh, so I, I was involved in white nationalism from 1987 to 1994. I uh, left because I, I was exhausted. It was miserable thinking and living that way. I had attempted suicide twice during that seven year span. And in 1994, I became a single parent. And uh, a couple of months after that, uh, after a concert my band had played, a uh, second friend of mine was murdered in a street fight and I had lost count of how many friends that were incarcerated by that point. So that's when I, I chose to finally leave hate groups and uh, being a man of extremes, I went from being a white power skinhead to being a raver within the, the span of a, a year and a half or so. And so here I am a year, a year and a half out from being a vicious, violent racist and I'm shaking my butt to house music on the south side of Chicago at 4 a.m. on a Sunday morning with thousands of people, every possible ethnicity and, and socioeconomic background you can imagine and really loving every minute of it. And, and that was very formulative in, in my, my path to today, which uh, really kind of evolved in, in certain stages. I quit drinking in 2004. That was a big step forward. Uh, I was 18 years alcohol-free as of uh, January 1st this year. And I uh, started writing in 2007, um, what would eventually come my first book, My Life After Hate. Uh, 2009, I conceived of the organization Life After Hate, uh, registered the domain name, founded the organization with a dear friend of mine named Angie Aker, and really poured my heart and soul into it for three years. In 2012, a man who was part of the skinhead gang I had helped to found in 1988, attacked the sick temple of Wisconsin in Oak Creek and murdered seven people. And uh, the last person he murdered was a man named Satwant Singh Kalika. In 2012, uh, October, uh, his son Pardeep reached out to me and I resigned from Life After Hate to work with Pardeep and uh, his organization Serve to Unite, which connected kids through arts-driven service learning and global engagement. And I've been doing that ever since, uh, along with uh, a good amount of filmmaking. Uh, I'm a, a professional speaker. And uh, today I'm on the advisory board for a brilliant group called Parents for Peace, which has adopted Surf to Unite as one of their initiatives in, a, in an effort to scale it. And Parents for Peace uh, addresses violent extremism as a public health issue really depoliticizing it and uh, seeing it for the uh, uh, trauma-based uh, condition that it is rather than a political one. And uh, very grateful to be a part of Parents for Peace. And uh, again, grateful to everyone at the McCain Institute for putting this event together and for organizing the Prevention Practitioners Network. Thank you all so much. And thank you so much, Arna, for sharing your story. It's definitely inspirational and aspirational for practitioners, for formers, for uh, the McCain Institute staff. Um, so we're very grateful that you carved out some time out of your schedule to speak with us. And um, we hope that this is helpful for other practitioners and other people who may be caught in a path similar to yours and is looking for other avenues. Um, we thank you all very much for your time and appreciate you sharing your story with us. Awesome. Thank you, Irma. And 